Hello, everyone. It's good to see you tonight. Everybody's visiting and talking, and that's a wonderful thing to see. But we need to get started. So let's open with prayer this morning. Father, it's been a busy day, and many who are here tonight have worked all day and have rushed home and rushed to get here. I pray, Lord, that as we spend time in your word tonight, you would settle us down. You would open our hearts, clear our minds, help us to focus on the message that you have for us this evening. We give this time to you. Please use it in Jesus' name. Amen. Sometimes, when you've been really hurt by someone, it's hard to get past what they've done to you. Maybe you've trusted someone only to have them stab you in the back, and it's hard to get past that betrayal. Maybe someone you considered to be a friend has been gossiping behind your back and sharing conversations that you had made in confidence. Maybe someone has stolen from you. Maybe someone has hurt one of your kids or taken advantage of you, leaving you angry and raw and unwilling to have anything to do with them again. We've all been there. We've all had people let us down, broken our hearts. But as Christians, the situation gets even more difficult. God commanded us to forgive But sometimes it's hard to let go of the hurt. It's almost impossible to forget what they've done. Scripture says we are to love, but that could leave us open to being hurt again. People claim they have changed, but how can we be sure that it's not just a ploy to get back into our good graces? Well, tonight we're going to look at a tiny little book in the New Testament, Philemon. It's kind of hard to find. Um, It's only one chapter, 25 verses. It's located right after Titus and just before you get to Hebrews. It's easy to flip past it if you're not careful. It was written by Paul. um, And he's writing to a friend at the church in Colossae on behalf of a new believer. But there is a painful history between Philemon and and Onesimus, and Paul is writing as a mediator between the two. To give you a little bit of background to help you understand the situation better, Paul had been arrested when he was in Jerusalem, and over the next two years, he had been through a series of several trials, and finally he asked to present his case before Caesar. And so he was transported to Rome and placed under house arrest. Now, Acts 28.16 tells us, And Luke was writing this. He said, when we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. And then in Philippians 1.13, it says, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. So while he was under house arrest, he was chained to the guard who was responsible for him. But while he was there, Paul was able to to present the gospel to his guards, and to anyone he came to visit. Now, Paul is writing this letter to Philemon. He was a believer in the church at Colossae, which is located in what today would be Turkey. Paul hadn't started the church there, but he had spent three years ministering in Ephesus, and the Colossian church was started as uh, as, uh, a spring from that particular ministry. Philemon was very well-to-do. He owned at least one slave. He probably had several others. He had a church, (laughs) scratch that, he had a house that was large enough for the church in Colossae to meet there. And just the fact that he owned a slave showed that he was very wealthy. Slaves in the Roman Empire at this point in time sold for at least 500 denarii. Now, one denarii was a day's wages for the common worker. So 500 denarii, it would take close to a year and a half to earn enough money to buy one slave. But records also show that if you bought an educated or a skilled slave, they could be priced as high as 50,000 denarii. And that is the reason that Paul is writing this letter to his friend Philemon. Philemon's slave, Onesimus, had run away 1,200 miles to Rome. 
He had apparently stolen from his master in order to finance his journey, and he hoped to just disappear in the large population there in the capital city of Rome. But at some point, he met Paul, and then he met Jesus, and he committed his life to the Lord, and now he wants to make things right. But therein lies the problem. A slave was considered property, and his master could do with him whatever he wanted to. He could be scourged, he could be mutilated, he could be crucified, he could be thrown to wild beasts. In fact, there's one account where uh, one master threw his slave into a pool of man-eating fish. There were 60 million slaves throughout the Roman Empire And they were sold like pieces of merchandise, completely under the control of their owner. So, Paul writes to Philemon on behalf of Onesimus. We're going to start in Philemon with the first seven verses. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Now, as a recognized, no, I'm sorry, (laughs) back up here. It's believed that Aphia was Philemon's wife, and Archippus may have been their son, or he could possibly have been an elder in the church there. Usually, when Paul starts his letter, He introduces himself as an apostle of Christ, establishing his authority. But he doesn't do that here. He's not pulling rank. He is communicating as a friend. And even though it's a personal letter to Philemon and Aphia, he also includes the church because everyone would know about the circumstances surrounding Onesimus leaving and the whole church would be a part of Onesimus of Onesimus coming back. Paul blesses Philemon with God's grace and peace and speaks of his respect for Philemon. Philemon has shown the love of Jesus to those in his church. He has exhibited great faith, and Paul has been encouraged by his friendship and by his witness and example to others. But after establishing all of that, that he sees Philemon as a friend and he's aware of his reputation as a Christian leader, Paul now presents his request. I'm going to pick it up in verse 8. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I'm sending him back. He is my very heart. Back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do would not seem forced but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was so that you might have him back forever, no longer a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother. He is very dear to me and even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. As a recognized leader in the church at that time, Paul could have taken a completely different approach. He could have just kept Onesimus with him and sent word back to Philemon that he needed Onesimus's services. Or he could have ordered Philemon to take Onesimus back and treat him with Christian love. But he's also taking into account Philemon's feelings. Philemon had invested a lot of money in Onesimus. 
And then the slave had run away, stealing from him in the process. No doubt Philemon was angry and hurt over his slave's actions. But he's kind of in a predicament here. If he just forgave Onesimus, would that encourage other slaves to do the same thing? And what would other slave owners think, friends of Philemon, if this slave got away with no consequences at all? On the other hand, Philemon was a Christian leader. If he punished Onesimus, how would that affect his testimony? By writing this letter and by addressing it not only to Philemon, but to the church as well, Paul takes all the responsibility on himself. He describes how Onesimus has changed. He's not just a slave. He is Paul's spiritual son. And now he's a brother in Christ to Philemon. And before, his heart hadn't been in serving his master, which led to him wanting to escape. But now he had committed his life to Jesus and living for him. And his whole attitude was different. He would give his best efforts to serving his master now. Paul very clearly shares his love for Onesimus. He says, I'm sending my very heart back to you. Onesimus has been a comfort to Paul. He's made his time in chains more bearable. But Paul wants to be honest and upfront with Philemon too. Onesimus is a Christian, but he's still a slave. And he is still the property of Philemon. He almost leaves the door open. I don't want to force you to let me keep Onesimus, but if you decide to volunteer for him to stay with me, well, that's up to you. Paul even goes so far as to suggest that God has used Onesimus running away from home to bring him to Paul and into the faith so that Onesimus could return to Philemon, a changed man. And even more, uh, and even more beneficial than he was before. Not just a slave, but a fellow believer who would spend eternity with him. Paul knows this isn't an easy solution for Philemon, so he gives. He goes even further, taking all the responsibility for Onesimus's actions on himself. I'm going to pick it up again in verse 17. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one more thing. Prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. As do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Paul was offering to put his money where his faith was. He would repay any debt that Onesimus might owe. He didn't ignore the slave's crimes. He didn't say, forget about anything that was stolen. He said, put it on my account. Paul was willing to pay the price. Paul reminds Philemon that it was he who led Philemon to Christ. He says, you owe me your very self. So Philemon and Onesimus both had the same spiritual father. And you wonder what Paul was hinting at when he said, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. I wonder if he was suggesting that Philemon free Onesimus and then send him back to Paul. From his last words, Paul fully expected to be released from prison um, in the very near future, and he wanted to spend some time with Philemon and Aphia and the church that met in their home. Now, we don't know from Scripture how this all worked out, but there was a letter written 50 years later by a church father by the name of Ignatius. And he wrote to the Ephesians talking about their wonderful minister, their bishop, 
and his name was Onesimus. And he went on to write, The one who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful to both you and to me, the very words that Paul had used in his letter. So what does all this mean for us today? Well, Martin Luther pointed out that we are Onesimus. We were slaves to sin, running away from God the Father. And the penalty was death. That's what we deserved. But when we met Christ, he became our mediator. He goes before the Father on our behalf. And like Paul, he says, whatever this one's done wrong, whatever they owe, charge it to me. I will cover the cost. And just as Paul urged Philemon to receive Onesimus as a brother, as part of his family, Jesus makes a way that we can become a part of God's family, adopted as his children. That's grace. And it's beautiful. And it's exciting. But the letter to Philemon challenges us in another way. We have all had people who have hurt us who have let us down, who've disappointed us, who've taken advantage of us and left us hurt and angry and our hearts closed to the one who has caused so much pain. Sometimes we want to get even. (laughs) We want to hurt them back. We want them to pay for what they've done to us. Or at the very least, we just shut them out of our lives and have nothing else to do with them to avoid them at all costs. But Paul's letter to Philemon shows us that people can change. When they meet Jesus, they are entirely different people. And Jesus wants us to give them a chance to look at them not for what they've done to us, but as brothers and sisters in Christ, to open our hearts to them again, to realize that just as we're not the same people we used to be, Christ has done a work in their lives as well. And if the Lord can forgive and love them, how can we do any less? This is a very short book with a very big message. It's true. We've all been hurt by others. But to be honest, at some point, we've all hurt others. It may not have been intentionally. Sometimes we can't even say that. And we can explain and rationalize and make excuses for anything that we've done, but we are often unwilling to be as gracious to others. And Jesus' example and Paul's challenge here is not to get even and not to hold a grudge and not to cut them out of our lives, but to treat them as family. And let's be honest, sometimes our family, those closest to us, are the ones that hurt us the deepest. But we don't give up on them. Sometimes we love them in spite of what they have done. And we have all hurt God's heart. We have all sinned. We have all failed to be the people that he has called us to be. So when someone has caused you a lot of pain, take it to Jesus. If someone has hurt you or disappointed you, lay it at the Lord's feet. Let him deal with that other person. Tell Jesus all about it and be honest with what you're feeling. You don't have to sugarcoat it. You don't have to sound noble and nice. Just put it all out there and let the Lord handle it. And if the Lord brings about a change of heart in that one, brings him back to the faith, changes his attitude, then for heaven's sake, on the basis of love, be willing to accept them back as a brother or sister in Christ. Then you too will know the grace and peace of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, as we talk tonight, I am sure that each one of us had a name or maybe several names that came to mind as we considered those who have hurt us. And Lord, sometimes that hurt goes deep. But Lord, we want to reflect you in all that we do and say, and with all the people that we encounter. So I pray, Lord, that you would heal that hurt, that you would help us to see others as you see them, 
that you would work in the hearts of those who don't know you and draw them to the faith. And, Father, that we would be willing to accept them back and to love them in Jesus when they turn their lives over to you. In Jesus' name, amen.